Good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Awesome. Welcome to the Coastal Studies Institute. And tonight is our kickoff for the Science on the Sound lecture series. We're happy to have all of you here tonight. My name is Terry Kirby Hathaway, and I'm the Marine Edu Education Specialist with North Carolina Sea Grant based here at CSI. And I'm really excited about our speaker tonight. I'd like to, to introduce Dr. Paul Hosier to you. He's Professor Emeritus in the Department of Biology and Marine Biology at UNCW. Following his retirement six years ago, after 41 years of teaching at UNCW, he's still an adjunct professor there, which I'm glad to hear. Uh, his teaching history includes courses like ecology, research methods in biology, barrier island ecology, and more, going back to 1972. And just as a little trivia bit, I took ecology and research methods from here in 1977 and 78. That's why I'm excited that he's here. Neither one of us had gray hair then, just to let you know. <laughs> but he's also served in administrative uh, positions at UNCW, Director of Academic Computing, and Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs and Provost. And his research efforts over the years have looked at studies of the impact of off-road vehicles on shorelines and the ecological processes of barrier islands in the southeast. He received his bachelor's degree from New Paltz State University in New York, his master's from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and his PhD from Duke University. But we are glad he's here anyway, even though he's from Duke. So um, please hold all your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, we are trying to stream online, and we want to make sure that the people who are listening online or watching online can hear the qu answers and the questions. So I'm going to bring this microphone to the people answering, uh, asking questions. So please hold them to the very end. Uh, we'll also be taking, well, I guess we're not. Uh, John just said we're not online live, but we will be archiving. He's recording this and it'll be archived and put on the, for people who cannot see it live, like you guys will. And just to let you know, next month's Science on the Sound talk is set for Thursday, October 17th. Dr. Rebecca Ash, who's an assistant professor of fisheries biology at ECU, will be speaking about fish reproduction in North Carolina estuaries. So Dr. Hosier's talk tonight is going to focus on seacoast flora and the ecology of the Carolinas, featuring this book, Seacoast Plants of the Carolinas, which is a recent addition which thankfully replaced the 1973 version. <laughs> Took a long time for him to work on this book. You've been working on it since then, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, we don't have any books for sale tonight, but Downtown Books is offering a 10% discount. If anybody wants to purchase a book from them, you can put your name, print your name and your phone number on this sheet. I will fax it or I'll email it to Jamie and she will get in touch with you either tomorrow or Friday to get your book. So we'll just pass that around if you want to put your name on there. And this book, like I said, just came out last summer and this is a UNC Press book. So we're really proud of this book. Let's see, anything else I need to tell you? Oh yeah, by the way, after the talk, there will be two trivia questions. So pay attention and perhaps you'll be the winner of one of the copies of the, the book. So you don't have to buy it for 10% off. So there will be two trivia questions. So those of you who brought notebooks, <coughs> good job on you. All right. You ready? I'm ready? All right. Come on down. Right. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Terry. Yeah, it's been a long, long ride for Terry and I over uh, decades now. But uh, it's, it's been fun. And I know Terry's enjoyed life, and I've enjoyed life too. And so we're... We're having a good time. Let me go ahead and uh, talk tonight about the ecology in the coastal area, primarily from the ocean edge on back into the sound, or at least to the, to the uh, mainland area dominated by, by forests. And I want to talk about plants. I want to feature some of the plants. Many of the plants you might know. Maybe I can tell you a thing or two different and new about these plants and give you a sense for what's happening here at the coast. When you think of the coastal area and um, compare it, say, with a tropical rainforest, the rainforest actually controls pretty much the environment. 
That is to say, when you have this huge complex of very tall trees, medium-sized trees, small trees, shrubs, herbs, and whatever, the humidity is actually controlled by the vegetation, the plants. So it would be rainfall, rainfall that you receive at the top of the forest canopy in the tropical rainforest is, is probably have very little relationship with what reaches the ground. And so the plants are in charge of, so to speak, creating that particular environment. Much different out here. Here, the environment is the physical factors. They are the dominant factor in controlling what we see out here. So let me uh, give you kind of a road map to where we're going and what we're going to do and talk about tonight. Let me get started. Here are some, here's kind of the road map of what I'd like to talk about. First, I do want to talk about the environment and give you the environmental setting for where we are. You are all living in it. You know what it is, but I want to put it in the context of the plants that are surviving out here, what they're facing. And then I want to talk about some specific habitats, the rack line, the dunes, the, the maritime grasslands, uh, trees, shrubs, the tidal marsh plants, the forest, et cetera. And then I'm going to uh, take a look at, in this particular case, most of the plants are tidal marsh plants, or excuse me, are native plants from here on up. And then I want to talk just a couple of minutes about plants that are not invited in here or may, that may have been invited in here but turned into kind of bad boys, so to speak. And then uh, maybe finish with a, a few examples of plants that were uh, of interest in terms of being useful or interest, having interesting features or something like that and give you an idea of that there are some really neat things going on out here, okay? So that's where we're going and how, how we'll get there, we'll, we'll do it right now. When you look at the coastal environment, probably the wind and the accompanying salts that are whipped up by the wind are the dominant factor controlling all the vegetation out here. There's also, on the sound side, salt water or brackish water, even on up to fresh water in the northern parts of Currituck uh, Sound. And those factors, along with the tidal activity, amplitude of the tides, control what's going on on the backside. So again, here's those physical factors I'm talking about. High solar radiation, as you know, when you go out there, you're getting a sunburn. Unless you put your suntan lotion on, it is really penetrating in terms of the, the heat and the solar radiation that strikes these plants, and they have to be adapted to that kind of environment. The soils are very important. The soils in, in our North Carolina coastal environment are primarily sands. Sands are very coarse, generally, compared to, to the silts and clays of, of uh, inland soils for the most part. And so that plants have to deal with, with this very loose sand, lots of air pockets and that sort of thing. And also water, in terms of precipitation or other factors, penetrates or percolates through that soil very, very quickly. Very quickly. And as a result, something you might water today out in the uh, in your yard may actually be uh, uh, impacted quite dramatically in one day as to whether the availability of water. So this is an important factor. And uh, so I wanted to consider that. Obviously storms are extremely important, whether you're talking about nor'easters, or you're talking about hurricanes, uh, you know, you go through them constantly and we can talk briefly about what's happening here with, with the ability of the plants to, to survive this kind of environment. And then uh, human development, you see development all up and down the coast. You can compare the development of the vegetation, the structure of the vegetation down in the uh, middle of, of Cape Hatteras Island, or the Hatteras Island and Ocracoke Islands, and compare it with going up to uh, uh, Nags, up through Nags Head and Kill Devil Hills and Kitty Hawk and Southern Shores and Corolla and all that. So those are the kinds of factors that these plants have to worry about. And you can see them on the slide there. Let's keep, keep all those in mind as we go forward. Okay? 
So let's talk about the rack line and start on the ocean side, look across and say, what do we, what do we have here? What are, what are some of the plants? And I wanted to feature a couple of plants. And if you look at uh, what's happening out there, two plants that I picked occurring on, on the, the rack line or in that zone, if you lay your blanket down on the beach, typically you're above the rack line. That's the line where the debris that's washing around in the ocean goes up to its highest point when the tide water rushes up and then starts back down again. It usually leaves a little line of the vegetation debris and that sort of thing. Above that, plants can survive. Anytime you, you look at that area on the shoreline, you'll see that there's no plants seaward of that. It's, it's just too churned up every day, every hour, that sort of thing. So you want to you wanna take a look at this in terms of, of long-term survival. So these plants occur above the edge of that rack line, and these are plants that are almost exclusively found in that rack line. Now look at what I've written for each one of those. For sea rocket, Kakaili harperi, and we have here also car, uh, Kakaili edentula that uh, for, occurs further north and goes on up into New England. Very common throughout that rack line. Not very common anywhere else. Virtually absent once you get back in the dunes. When you look at sea beach amaranth, not very common, but quite rare. It's actually federally designated as a threatened species. These plants have different lifestyles, and this really leads to their abundance. This particular plant grows over the winter and into the summertime, becomes a relatively large plant, as does the sea beach amaranth. That's as big as a bushel basket, a good sized plant. This would be of a similar size. This particular plant is able to survive nicely because it's uh, uh, succulent. It holds moisture in the, in the leaves, so during a dry period, it's, uh, it can survive. And the same thing with sea beach amaranth. Sea rocket, on the other hand, is capable of being buried by sand, blowing sand around on the beach. And as the plant matures and produces these fruits, there's two different fruits on each one of these, whether you can see it or not. There's a top and a bottom to each of those fruits. The top fruit breaks off, gets blown around, rolls all over the place. The bottom seed fruit, this part right here versus this part right here, this part remains on the plant and typically becomes buried by sand. And it will germinate and start growing next year. So it's already in place. It has two methods of surviving and spreading. One is it remains in place and grows again next year because it's an annual plant. And the other method is that it rolls around and disappears somewhere else in the dune system and then begins to grow the next year. So it is a very effective dispersal mechanism in place and dispersed. So it's got the same kind of, of growth pattern as combined. A dandelion, go out, and a live oak, which drops to the ground. So you don't find live oaks too far away from the mother plant. All right, this plant, on the other hand, has a very tiny seed. It does get to roll around, but it's not much bigger than a, than a large grain of sand. And it often can get buried very deep and will not grow. These are very large seeds. These are relatively small seeds. And so this particular plant has difficulty growing. Okay? So that's what makes these different in terms of their, their growth ability. When we look at the dune systems now, the dune system, there are five species that dominate our dune systems. Five species that dominate the dune systems. 
American beach grass, which really occurs from about Cape Hatteras north into New England. So you can go to Cape Cod, you can go to uh, New Jersey to Rehoboth Beach, and you'll see it dominating in beaches there. Sea oats is the dominant plant roughly from Cape Hatteras, although it occurs north on up into, trickles into, into Maryland, but predominantly south of here. It's a warm species grass, and it will survive and grow on the beach all the way, or dunes, all the way down into Texas and Mexico. So those are the two dominant grasses. Panic grass is an auxiliary grass. You'll see that all through our dune systems here, and as we go further south, we see salt meadow cordgrass. Salt meadow cordgrass occurs on the dune systems here in, in North Carolina and on further south. That particular plant now is really controversial because everybody's upset because the genus has been changed from Spartina to Sporobolus. So instead of having Spartina alterniflora, Spartina patens, and Spartina sinusoroides, which roll off everybody's tongue fairly easily, <laughs> it's now Sporobolus primulus, Sporobolus alterniflorus, and Spartina, or uh, Sporobolus uh, sinusoroides has stayed the same, but with Sporobolus in front of it. So that's an issue, uh, and some people go, no, you can't do this to me. I learned this, you know, when I was knee-high to a grasshopper or knee-high to a sea oak plant or whatever. And so uh, that's an issue that, that we're having to deal with as, as time goes on. And then finally, the fifth species of importance is sea elder, Iva imbricata, not a grass. You can see it's not a grass. It's actually in the aster family. So it, it's a plant that is living in an area like this. So why are these plants here? They're here for a couple of reasons. One, the salt from the, the ocean. Wind will pick up as the waves break on shore. You watch, it'll spew up water. And as it spews up water, that's picked up by the wind and most of it drops back right into the water because the drops are that big or that big or that big. But anything aerosol sized, the kind of thing where you spray your room and you watch the little tiny things suspended in the air, the tiny droplets, that size droplet is carried landward and deposited on these plants. It washes off really easily on these plants and they're also adapted to surviving that salt landing on the surface. The other factor for these grasses is where their growing buds are, where their overwintering buds are. They're underground, except for sea elder. All the grasses have parts of the plant that will sprout next year growing underground, okay? So that's the uh, reason why we find grasses dominating the dune systems. There's nothing uh, wrong with why a, a, a trees and shrubs shouldn't be out there on the beach. They can grow in the sand, they grow in the sand further back, but they're away from the effects of salt spray and the growing buds that are under the surface here, as sand accumulates around them, these plants love to grow. They grow quickly and, and spread far, as compared to, say, a, a shrub or a tree, okay? So the dune systems are important in preserving our shoreline, and those are the examples of, of the plants that are best adapted. The maritime grasslands, are quite common around here. If you drive down across Oregon Inlet, go into Pea Island and further south down to Salvo and Waves in that area, Rodanthe, you'll see as you drive down there these wide, flat, nearly featureless plains dominated by grasses. 
and gradually there are some shrubs that will come in on an area like that. But where washovers are very common, that is when the storms approach the shoreline and push the waves up over the top and break through the dunes and then wash across the island, those kinds of areas are dominated by other kinds of grasslands or grasses and are called maritime grasslands, well with the exception of goldenrod. But uh, these other are grasses, the dune hair grass. You may have seen, for example, in the fall driving down to Salvo and see very large uh, purple uh, plants of the dune hair grass. We have some examples out here in front that have been planted in the native plant uh, garden along the, the entrance here. And that grass gradually turns a, a yellowish color by the time uh, f late fall sets in and the seeds are dispersed. But salt meadow gra cord grass occurs there as well as these other species. And you'll see them successively coming to prominence as the fall season goes on. Usually those kinds of flat areas or, or areas distant from the dune system and distant from the ocean gradually are colonized by uh, shrubs and forest trees. So in the shrub thickets, we have two really common plants around here, the wax myrtle and the, the myrtle of wax. The myrtle part of it is myrtle beach, for example, so you know it's common all the way down into there is common all the way down the, the east coast and a very common plant throughout the, uh, the southeast and into the gulf. And this particular plant is extremely salt tolerant. It does take a beating, say, during a storm that might occur like around here just recently. You can look at your wax myrtles that are closest to the ocean, maybe all brown on one side. And that's killed, by the, killed back by the salt aerosols that have been carried landward during the storm. The other species is northern bayberry, and the northern bayberry really occurs from about Cape Hatteras. So Cape Hatteras really is a, a break for many species. From Cape Hatteras north, the northern bayberry, the, the bayberry plant, is very common. And you can go on to Cape Cod, the, the uh, early uh, developer, or <laughs> Colonists, shouldn't say developers, colonists have actually uh, uh, used those to build candles and things like that. And uh, they come from the wax that's on the surface of those seeds, or those, yeah, those seeds on that plant. Okay, so these two plants are really common along the coastal area. It will come in when there's enough sand movement that stays away keep the sand movement out close to the beach. Further back, not much sand movement. These shrub thickets will continue to, uh, to develop predominant with these two plants. Now the, the granddaddy of them all along the coastal area, especially in North Carolina, South Carolina, even going on into the uh, more southern states, is live oak. This is, the, this is the plant that shows the greatest influence from the salt spray, and you see that the plants, if they're far enough away from the beach, will take on a nice rounded shape like that photograph. If they're fairly close to the beach, they'll have that sheared look that's developed as a result of the impact of salt aerosols on the leaves. So live oak is, is really important in that particular one is common only on the coast, roughly from northern North Carolina, maybe southern Virginia, south throughout the southeast, and again, across uh, parts of the uh, Gulf down into Texas. And contrasting with that is the southern red oak, which is a, a, another oak, but a somewhat different species. You can see the leaves are much bigger they're nice and shiny, so they resist the influence of salt spray. They love growing in sand, but they're found, as you can see, you can read, uh, 
throughout the New, New England area and on down through the southeast out to the middle of the country. And this particular plant then really replaces live oaks as we go further north. So if you get into to Maryland, Virginia, and northern areas, this will be the more common plant. And a couple other species just wanted to point out. Uh, the holly, American holly, beautiful plant. You can see the beautiful red berries. It's interesting that that particular plant is is uh, loved by virtually everybody because of that, the, the beautiful dark green pointy leaves and then uh, the very red berries at, at holiday time. And so you often associate this plant with the holiday season. That inset is a lichen that occurs on the trunk and it occurs in a red phase like that and also kind of a milky white phase. So you can go up to some place like Nags Head Woods and walk through you find some of these American hollies, you'll see either a red or a, looks like you painted something with, a, with milk. And that's, that's the lichens that have developed on that particular tree. And they're very attractive. As you can see, it's almost as dark red as, as the berries are. So an interesting plant, and one that is, occurs all the way up through New England and Cape Cod and that area. One I, I like, and that's why I put it in here to, to just mention it to you tonight, is persimmon. And you probably have seen persimmon all along our area around here. Loves to be in sand. Well, Jockey's Ridge, you look at Jockey's Ridge. You can walk out on the walkway, go leading out to the, the dune on, from the uh, headquarters or from the, the uh, uh, office, and you'll find persimmon growing right along that boardwalk. It's a, a beautiful plant, I think. Uh, it's got wonderful red fruits, or orangish, orangish red fruits that uh, uh, are really sweet if you uh, get them at the right time. But the fact that it loves the hot, dry, sunny weather is what makes it so common. And in fact, if you drive up Highway 12 and you go through Duck and, and on up to Corolla, you'll see it growing on the roadsides too. And it's because the roadsides have been cleared, they're open sand, and there's plenty of sunlight, and you'll find these plants dotting all along Highway 12 going on up in that direction. So that's another wonderful plant that we can, we can work with. All right, let's look at the marsh then. So we go on over to the marsh side, and we begin to see different kinds of plants because it's a totally different environment. And again, it's strongly physically controlled by the tides, falling, rising and falling of tides, wind tides, as well as, as regular tides, uh, or solar or, uh, lunar tides, and also by the amount of salinity. So whether they're very saline, down by, say, Oregon Inlet, where the seawater is coming in full strength, all the way up towards uh, Currituck or up towards Duck, where it gradually becomes fresher and fresher and fresher. The dominant plants here are smooth cord grass. Again, notice it's sporobolus, alternaflorus. They had to change the floras, flora, the A, to a U.S. to match the genus sporobolus. So there's a slight change in both, uh, both names. So smooth cord grass is the dominant uh, vegetation, dom dominant plant species, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Not much can survive when their roots are standing in salt water. And that's really what this plant is doing. The roots are standing in salt water. So they have to have a mechanism. They've got to get water into the roots. And they can't take in salt water into the roots because it will kill the cells. Too much salt will kill the cells. They just can't grow. So these plants have mechanisms that exclude those large NaCl type uh, ions out of the roots and just allow H2O to come in the plant. And as a result, they're able to tolerate that kind of salinity. 
That's why they're the only ones there, because that's a tough deal. That's an energy cost. It takes energy to get water separated from those salts and brought in to the roots. So it's a very energetically cost, costly process. This plant has figured out how to do it. <coughs> Black needle rush, a plant that's also found throughout the uh, area, and black rush, which occurs on further north, those, those two uh, rushes have similar capabilities, but not to the extent that uh, the smooth cordgrass does. So it's found in large patches. If you go down, if you go down east, you go down off, off Ocracoke and take the ferry to down east in Carteret County, you'll find that that huge swaths of marsh on that road taking you down to Beaufort, Moorhead City, are dominated by black needle rush, which is brackish. It's not full strength seawater, it's brackish water and the plants are able to tolerate that and separate out enough water from the salts in order to, to nourish the plant. Okay, you can see the different flowers. Usually you don't see flowers of these. The, uh, Smooth cord grass has flowering about midsummer, and you know this would be an early summer picture where you see no flowering stalks, but it will be almost white with the anthers and, and uh, uh, stigmas here when the plant is in flower. The black needle rush, you can see actually the black needle rush flowers are actually down inside this area right here. So you look like, it looks like the flowers are uh, tucked, in, tucked into the, the plant. So right along in there, you'll see if you look at those areas closely, that's where the flowers are. All right, one of my favorite plants is sea oxi. I like the, the color, they're, they're beautiful yellow and brown, and even the fruit. Uh, See, I put a fruit in there just because I like it. But you can see the fruits are, are really uh, neat and uh, they, they persist for some length of time before they break apart and disperse their seeds. But this particular plant is scattered throughout the marshy areas and in, usually in a dense patch. So it starts out with one or two or three plants and then gradually expands and it may be uh, several, it may be an acre in size or uh, something of that size over a period of time. A very nice plant, I enjoy uh, seeing that whenever I get out into the field. So that's another plant that's able to survive in this wetland kind of area with salts. Now I do want to mention Spartina, uh, not Spartina anymore, Spirobolus pumilus, the salt meadow cord grass. I wanted to give it what I would call special recognition, because this plant is found in the dunes, as I've already mentioned, I had a picture of it there. It's found in the grasslands, and it's also found in the salt marsh. So it's adjacent to the smooth cord grass, uh, Sporobolus alterniflorus. So they grow right next to one another, okay? So when it's interesting with the Sporobolus Pumulus, in New England, if you look at the marshes or you've been up there and you're familiar with the marshes, you have a tidal creek coming in to an area and the edges of the tidal creek are dominated by a very narrow band of smooth cord grass. And then anything beyond that going on away from the water is dominated by, by salt meadow cord grass. And the uh, early settlers up there actually grazed their horses on this kind of area. And it was called salt hay. And it was called salt hay for a reason, because they used to harvest that and feed their, their horses and their cattle with, with salt hay. That's what the marshes look like up there. A band of smooth cord grass, large expanses beyond that, and then going up to the upland of salt meadow cord grass. If you look at our marshes here, we have just the opposite. 
we have these huge areas of smooth cord grass, Sparopolis alterna floris, and then at the very upper edge, but still in the salt marsh, we have a very narrow band of salt meadow cord grass. So this particular species, very expanded in, in New England, it, it actually gets larger, it goes, moves up into the shrub thickets, into the forest, uh, or into the, uh, the gra uh, maritime grasslands, and then up into the dunes. So it's a very wide-ranging species. So that gets special mention of how widely distributed that plant is and how widely adapted it is to different environments. Other tidal marsh plants, we have sea lavender, and I'll just go through these uh, just quickly. You can read about them. Glasswort, often in restaurants and things like that near the coast. It's used sort of as a little condiment on top or a little something to top off a salad and you can eat it. So those are, are examples of other plants other than the dominant uh, Sporobolus alterniflorus and black needle rush, the Juncus romarianus. <coughs> okay, so we've now seen a whole bunch of different plants. You probably didn't realize how many plants you've actually been through, so to speak, in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, this is a plant that was introduced by horticulturalists about the time of Hurricane Hugo, or just after Hurricane Hugo, and it struck in the Charleston area and really devastated the dune systems. And the folks said, we need to get these, redo these dunes rebuilt as quickly as possible. And this particular plant was a native or is a native of, of Asia. And uh, brought here to try and stabilize the dune systems. And also, you can see it adds a lot of beautiful color to it. Look at the, the flowers are absolutely stunning. And even the fruits are kind of interesting, and they turn a, a dark brown to almost black when they're mature. So it's quite an attractive plant. However, note the last sentence there on that slide. It's not been very well behaved. What it did when it came in is it grew extremely well. It grew so well that it eliminated all the other plants on the, on the area. There, there, there's nothing on a dune after you plant this within a year or two or three or something like that. There's no, there's no other plants left. Sea oats is gone. The uh, uh, various other plants that you might find on a dune system are gone. And, uh, you know, people say, okay, okay, it's all right. I will, we'll survive or whatever. We love our sea oats, but we'll, we'll survive. And then that plant did probably the worst thing it could do and it grew down off the dune, the front of the dune, towards the ocean. It loves to be buried. The more you bury it, the better it grows. And the, that's where all the sand's accumulating at the base of the dune. And it came off that dune, and then the turtle people found out that it was impacting the way the sea turtles were laying their eggs. That was it for that plant because, you know, us flower type people were like, okay, okay. But the turtle people were like, no, we're not doing this. So as a result, uh, they actually had task force in North Carolina, South Carolina, because they introduced it into South Carolina and then gradually moved up to North Carolina and uh, actually go out and literally pull up every plant they could find. I mean, this lasted for several years, and it was amazing. I, you know, I was out actually doing some of this photography work, and I would call in and say, hey, there's, a, there's one out here, there's one here. And then it got to the point where it was everywhere. I could find, everywhere I went, you know, I found it. Uh, so they had, they had knocked it down pretty well, but they couldn't get exactly rid of it. I thought this might be one plant that we could conquer but I'm not sure it is because the pressure you had to keep on that was so intense in terms of every year, hordes of people out on every beach 
trying to get rid of this plant off the dunes. And if we, if we did do that, we could get rid of it, but we haven't yet, but we have at least hope for that. So that's one of the, the bad ones. That's one of the bad boys that uh, we want to think about making sure we get rid of. Another one is common reed. And this common reed is an important plant. We have common reed around here. It's a native plant. Phragmites australis is a common native plant, not a common native plant, reasonably native uh, common plant. But what's happened with this plant is that the European variety of the same species has interbred with our species and this essentially hybrid vigor has taken over and the plant has gone crazy. And in my lifetime, in my lifetime since the 70s, I have seen this plant explode in terms of being found in the marsh edges, the wetlands, both fresh water and slightly brackish water. This plant has really taken over and you can see it. I know you can see it around here in the various places that it has gotten a foothold. And it gets a foothold, it, it's not a foothold, it's a 12 foot hold in some cases where the, the top of the following parts of the plant are, are 10, 11, 12 feet up in the air. And you can see how prolific the seeds, seeding is and there's one of the plants in full fruit. Not a good plant, but virtually impossible to get rid of now. And I know everybody around here likes this plant because I've traveled around in the last couple days looking at uh, areas in, in essentially from, the, from Corolla south down to here, including on the drive in, uh, where this plant has gotten loose, either been planted or gotten loose. And I, I'm beginning to understand why it's where it is. Because there are big spaces, there are big properties here there are big houses. There are houses that are three and four stories tall. And there are properties that are, you know, an acre or two or three acres, which some of these houses are on. And there are also some that are on 80 foot lots too. But uh, this particular plant will fill a space in nothing flat. It, it, within just a few years, it will, it will be up a story and a half, as you can see by that particular uh, slide right there. It will grow very, very rapidly. And worst of all, is if you don't keep after it, it really gets ratty looking, as that other photograph shows you. So this is a real problem. Uh, in fact, this past spring in Wilmington, they, th there was one that was kind of separating properties, uh, one development from another, and they decided to, uh, to chop it down because it was kind of like getting really wide. And I'm not kidding. They came in there with chainsaws. They had to use chainsaws to cut something that size down. I couldn't believe it. But they were there with these huge trucks. and They had four or five trucks and four or five people working chainsaws. and They had front end loaders and all that sort of stuff loading up the material. So it can, it can get out of control. Now I've seen some around here that are wildly out of control. I've also seen some where somebody has been very meticulous and for years and years and years have obviously clipped that back every year and it, it stayed in a relatively small size. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not that great. It's not native. We don't like it. But it seems to have, you know, if, if you pin me down, it seems to have uh, an ability to, uh, to be useful in some ways. And you can see that, that despite what many uh, people will say, that, that there are, those birds are in there eating uh, the fruits of that and thinking, oh, this is pretty good. Now, unless there's no nutrition value to it, I don't know, but uh, they're in there doing something with it. So it's, it's a particularly bad plant, so to speak. All right, so let's take uh, here in the next couple of minutes, take a look at uh, a couple of other plants that may be either interesting uh, or of, uh, of note. Sea myrtle, Baccarus helimifolia. This is the plant that in the fall, we may have 
destroyed the season here with this storm that passed through. But in the fall, especially along the intracoastal waterway and places like that, you'll find this huge white shrubby shrub bush. And it, it just comes from nowhere. It's all the green background all summer long, and then all of a sudden in October, November, it explodes into this beautiful mass of, of white. And it's very uh, uh, puffy and fluffy, and it really is quite, quite pretty. This particular plant seems to have a habitat which is expanding. And it's expanding if you drive on any of the interstates, especially, say, I-40 driving to to uh, uh, Raleigh from Wilmington, for example, which I, I do uh, on occasion. And it's, it's in all the ditches. It was never anywhere, it was never anywhere we ever saw for years and years and years. As soon as they put I-40 in, that thing just appeared. And they have to get out there and chop it down because it starts to clog the, the sides of the road the, the, with, uh, with debris in the, in the edges of the roadway. So this particular plant is, as I say, an interesting and beautiful plant in its natural habitat and a growing issue uh, that has to be dealt with in its new habitat, which has just come about as a result of interstate construction. Another plant that you're probably familiar with is the resurrection fern, the fern that looks beautiful, uh, green, Nice, I love that color. The texture of the plant is beautiful. You can see the spore-bearing parts of the plant on the back side, underneath this surface, kind of a pale green, glaucous green color. But let this dry out. This is on a log. Well, I shouldn't say it's on a log. It's on a limb, usually on the horizontal, most horizontal limbs possible on, uh, on a particular uh, live oak tree, which it loves. And it grows there nicely all year long. And then when things dry out in the summertime, then it looks like this. And you go, well, that's a goner. And then you know, a few weeks later, you've got plenty of rainfall. Back looking like this. So it's a very adaptable plant. And very interesting ecologically and very interesting physiologically. Because most things, when they start to die, might have, you know, well, let me start before I say die. Most plants, animals, and that sort of thing have water anywhere from 70, 80, 90 percent water, like us. When we start to dry out, we'll get down to 70, 60, never probably down to 50 percent water, and then we die. There's just, we don't have enough. These plants can get way down into the 20s and 30s and that sort of thing and dry out very, very dry, and then rehydrate very quickly from, from very, very dry, from most other organisms, death level water content. So that's an interesting plant that we have uh, in the coastal area that is inter interesting to folks. You may be familiar with mistletoe. You usually don't see mistletoe until the leaves drop. If you go into the, the swampy uh, coastal plain areas, you'll find that mistletoe will be in the trees, often in, in red maple and other, pla other uh, species that are found in the, the uh, wetland areas, of wetland forest areas, along the rivers and things like that. And this particular plant is essentially a hemiparasite. You can see it's green, so it photosynthesizes, so it makes its own food. But at the same time, it drives modified roots, or what we call hostoria, into the stem of the tree. And oftentimes, you'll look and see, and there'll be a, a, uh, a spot where the tree, where the plant is, is anchored, and it's a, a round ball. And that's where the hostoria has gone into the tree, and, and the tree has reacted to it. So that's American uh, mistletoe, and a, an interesting plant. And oftentimes, you don't see the, the male flowers and female flowers. So that's a, a, a reasonably good look at male and female flowers, just to give you some, some view. OK, my time is running by fast. So let's look at uh, summing up 
and beginning to think about if you're interested in, in native plants, and more and more people are, this is becoming the thing to do, is to plant native plants in an area like this. These are all native plants. They've got beautiful flowers. They've got beautiful fruits. And you can see the different kinds of plants. Here's the fruits of some of those plants. And they, uh, they're very attractive and would be very nice in your, your property. And so I think that's the trend that's coming along. And I think if you, if you work with master gardeners or, or talk to folks, they're interested in what kind of plants, native plants, can you put in your yard? And so that's a whole nother talk, so to speak, but that's something that, that's important. Okay, so let's, let's just summarize real quick to remind you of what we talked about here. <laughs> uh, and then I'll, I'll be glad to take some questions if you'd like. So we're talking about coastal native plants, with the exception of those ones with the big no circle on them. These were all native plants that we're talking about. And you can see that they're in a wide variety of sizes and shapes and colors and everything else. And habits from everything from small duckweeds all the way up to live oak trees. And so the, the, you, you've got your pick of what native plants you can use if you want to use some of the gardens, or if you're just interested in what do I, what can I learn, what I want to know as much as I can, you've got a lot of plants uh, available to learn and understand what they, what and how they live. All these plants that we've talked about and I've tried to share with you some of the information are well adapted to their coastal environment. They're well adapted because they wouldn't be here if they weren't. It's sort of one of those simple logic things. If the plant can't grow in this kind of sandy soil, high solar radiation, salt intense air, it won't grow here. It'll, it'll be somewhere else. It'll be gone. So they're well adapted to our coastal habitats that we've seen. You can see how colorful all those last couple of slides show you the different colors, the different shapes, the different uh, fruits and flowers, etc., and uh, they're they're really quite nice. You've seen some plants that are useful, and I think of other plants, that, you know, all the time that are are useful plants for us as well as as something that's you know, useful or important. And uh, pointed out your bad apples. If you want to plant something other than bad apples, or other than that, those were just examples of myriad bad apples that, uh, that you turn to your native plants. Okay, so I'll be glad to take questions if you'd like. Terry wants to moderate, so Terry, go ahead and yep, moderate. Yeah, but first we're going to do our trivia drawing. Oh, okay. Trivia questions, everybody ready? <laughs> Let's see if you paid attention. All right, first question. Paul, you'll have to help me. Uh, See who gets their hand up first. All right. Yeah, right there. There's the first question answered. I'm sorry. I haven't asked a question. All right. What's your answer? Oh, you mean you got it? <laughs> oh, no, no. No. Pay attention, Wendy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. There are five plant species that thrive on our dunes and help stabilize them. Four of them are grasses. Name the one which is not a grass. Oh, in the back. Oh, in the back. It's what? Oh, that's right. Oh, let's oh, see. Can we get yeah. a little more specific? I think. No, it's not a purse line. All right. Jennifer. Yeah, you were next. Excuse me? No, that is no. not correct. I think this one. Sea elder. Sea elder is correct. You were so close in the back. So close. So close. All right. Good deal. All right. Second and final question of the evening. Name the threatened plant that may be found growing along the rack line on our beaches. Kate? Yes, go. very good. Congratulations. That's what you get for sitting towards the front. That's right. She sat in the front row. Okay. Wendy, you want to be the first to ask a question now since you had your, answer, your hand up? Hang on just a minute. i got to get this because we are live now. So we did go live a while ago. So please answer. I mean, ask. I have a question about Phragmites, mm -hmm. and is the, I don't know if you 
the Phragmites down along the Gulf Coast in Louisiana, is that the same genome as up here? Because I know that's being afflicted with that scale insect that's killing it. And uh -huh. I know down there they're really worried about it, but I was like, I don't know if any more research is going into that for maybe a biocontrol no, up here. But I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but it, it's very, very difficult. People are really, the scientists are concerned about killing off our native species. Right. And the, the only way you can really tell the two apart is to pull the leaf back and there are some, some scales and hairs that stick up on the inside of the leaf as it attaches, or re attaches to the stem. And that's the only difference between the invasive one and our native one. So everybody says, make sure you check with an expert before you start chopping down, burning out, taking out. But I was not familiar with uh, uh, an, an insect that's attacking it. Uh, that this that is, could be a good thing or a bad Louisiana. thing. Louisiana, Louisiana coast. Louisiana, I'll have to look at that. Okay, next question. Hey, I guess you oh covered everything. All right, never mind. Here you go. <laughs> What's up with the change from Spartina? <laughs> yeah. You know, when you look at Spartina alterniflora, you look at Spartina patens, and you look at, at uh, uh, Spartina sinusoroides, and then compare it to Sporobolus, which is a plant which occurs out on the dunes, and it's not, not here, it's down in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. And it occurs both on the, on the dunes and a little bit in the marsh. They don't look anything alike. They, the, uh, physically, they look alike with their leaf structure. But the flowers don't look anything like. The Spartinas all look alike. Sporobos looks like this, or Spartina like that. But when you do a genetic analysis of them, the genetic analysis reveals that these things are related. And so we've been going along with physical, visible, morphological similarities and differences. And when you actually look at their genetic origins, you find that these things are more closely related to Sporobolus than anything else. And so they've thrown them in with Sporobolus. So they did that in a paper two or three, I think 2014 or 2015. It'd be a long, long time before. <laughs> be a long time before it's accepted. Uh, the taxonomists, uh, you know, are, understand the need to change. Names are changing both of plants and animals all the time. All the time. It's just when it hits something that everybody's familiar with, then it becomes a problem. But I, you know, you can look in this book, and somewhere I'll, I'll say something about. The, the historic name or the, the original name of this plant was such and such, scientific, scientific name. And that gives you the signal for the name's been changed. And you can look through there and there's, there are a dozen or more. That, that, but that doesn't affect us, you know, you'll just learn the new one and go on because they're not very common. But boy, when you hit Spartina, it's a real mess and the, people just are very resistant to it. I mean, people are saying, I don't, want to, I don't want to change, I can't change, I can't change. Yes, ma'am. Wait, 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 wait. We brought in the sedge sample from the yes. marsh up at Southern Shores, and I was wondering where it's native from. It probably is a, 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 a native here. It, it, it would be in the area. The, the, the presence of a plant somewhere tells you that wherever you find it, the environment is suitable for the plant to grow. That is, it wouldn't be there if it didn't have the suitable comp uh, soil composition, soil moisture, whatever. The absence of a plant doesn't tell you anything. So the fact that it wasn't there in the site that you found this for the last 20 years meant nothing. It's just that it took that much time and some, some event like extra high flooding or something like that to bring those seeds to that spot. And so, you know, the absence of it and all of a sudden appearing uh, in our own backyard, we found that with the hurricanes that struck us in, in Wilmington, that all of a sudden we start to see plants we've never seen before. And they're washed in uh, with a high tide and, and, you know, they got thrown in that water and it, 
ran up on our property and then just sank in and the plant said, man, I'm glad that water's gone. I'm, let's see if anything's good here. And, and they start germinating and growing. So these kinds of events happen all the time. Have a question over here? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Um, the sand bean on your cover uh, uh -huh. sheet there, is that um, native to, is that uh, on the dunes or more in the maritime forest? Uh, it's more in the dunes. It it's is. actually in the dune system. It runs in between and amongst the, the combs of the, the sea oats and American beach grass and all that. And it just climbs around in there. And that's, well, I guess, rather one there at the very top or whatever. I've tried to get it in an open space. But it'll grow all through those grasses. The neat thing about that particular plant, let's see if you can see it. You can see the flowers. No, I don't see any fruits. The fruits are a typical bean structure. They're about uh, three inches long. They, they're green as they mature, sort of like a French green bean, or whatever you call the common bean that we eat. And over time, that dries out, turns brown. The outer coating, the formerly green, succulent bean, turns brown, dries out and begins to split. And all you have to do is go in there and touch it. And the two halves of the bean are under pressure. And so when you touch it, that bean explodes. And when it explodes, it twists. It's got a helical structure to it. So that when it's closed like this, and then it, it, you touch it and it splits, it goes like that and spreads the seeds all over. So it's really neat to just go, I mean, if you haven't got anything to do, you just walk through the dunes and you go, there's one just ready to do it. And you just touch it, and shoots the seeds, and you go to the next one. And that, that can occupy you for an hour. Thank you. <laughs> I have one other question. When we used to drive to the Outer Banks from Chapel Hill, um, there were orchids growing along this uh, waterway that covers uh, Washington and Tarle County. And I don't see them anymore. Um, do you have any comments? No, I, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that, the, the, probably the most common orchid like that is Spiranthes, which is in that book. And it's on a spiral uh, stalk. <coughs> and they're large enough to be able to see from the road driving by at 70 miles an hour. You could see them. And I don't, I don't know why they would disappear, because they are fairly common. They do have a fairly wide uh, environmental tolerance. So I don't know what, what might have happened. There may be there's a lot more flooding and that sort of thing uh, in those ditches. And it may well be that uh, the environment has changed enough that, that they don't survive. So I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help you. OK, any more questions? Oh, in the back, OK. <coughs> No, not until you get the microphone. <laughs> I was told okay. about that, the microphone. Oh, people online. Yeah, they're important too. Okay, <laughs> everyone's important, of course. Anyway, um, I've only lived here for about 10 years, and considering you've seen the coastal line for since the 70s, I was wondering what you think about the human development and the impact on the coast. Oh, it's been incredible. That's what It's been incredible. Yeah, I remember uh, beaches like Sunset Beach, Ocean Isle Beach, Bald Head, uh, even Oak Island, Topsail, uh, Bogue, Bogue Banks, just as well as the Outer Banks here. The first time I came up here was in the late 60s, and it's, it's absolutely incredible. The changes have been brought, the population increases, the size of the structures, uh, the infrastructure, the roads, the water systems, electricity, et cetera, it's just been immense. It really has changed the character. Uh, you can see areas that haven't been changed too much, probably on Cape Lookout the most, uh, because there hasn't been uh, too much tra other than off-road vehicle traffic. And, even then, when I first came here, that I saw the, one of the first off-road vehicles, a bright red Jeep of some sort. Everybody's looking at each other going, 
why are they driving that thing on the beach? They're going to lose that. Well, since then, we've lost quite a few red Jeeps, if, you, if you're familiar with it. Uh, so it, it, even that has been changed. But, uh, but the, the developed part of the beaches is really, really dramatically different. We're trying to hold the line now. And that's, that's probably the most serious difficulty that we have, is trying to hold the line. Once we put that structure here, we're not going to move it. All right? If you lived in Durham, your grandmother's house is in the same spot that it was way back in 1880 when she moved into it. And nothing has changed. Maybe a few trees have grown up, a few trees have been cut down, but the property boundaries are there. One, two, three, four. They're there. When you come here or anywhere along the coast, you have that very flexible shoreline that builds in some years, or even just months or days, and then erodes in the same time, months, days, or years. And what was your property line, the two furthest seaward are in the water. But your house is not moved. But you're protecting it with a seawall or with rock rubble walls or something like that. So that really has changed the dynamics along the shoreline. So that's what I see the most. Yeah. It's the, the hardest thing is to tell somebody, you've got to move your house. One is where, you know? Where, I mean, here you still have some open spaces, but other places, there's wall-to-wall -wall houses. You know, take Atlantic Beach down here in Moorhead City area. They had no space to put anything. I mean, you literally couldn't put another house there anywhere, let alone try and find a lot to put it on. It's just, it's just too much. We have yes, an sir. online question. Oh, all right. Yes, our online question is, do you encourage people to conserve and enhance native plant habitats? If so, when encouraging the public to embrace plant habitat conservation, what is the most important message you share? Yes, uh, the first part of the answer is yes, I do encourage people to use the native plants. Um, just like what we've been talking about here with the coastline, when you put the non-native plants in an area, they tend to change things. They'll change the butterfly population or they'll change and shift the bee populations from one place to another. And all these organisms are all interrelated with their plants, their plant hosts, and that sort of thing. So you actually are resulting in changing the natural environment by introducing species that are usually not found in this kind of area. So it's really a, a important to keep in mind that the native plants, animals, are the ones that are best adapted to a particular spot, particular environment, particular habitat particular spot in the shoreline. And when you start introducing other plants, you then really have to have interfered with natural processes and natural development of the organisms. Most often, those kinds of interactions are negative. All right, I want to thank everybody. That was our last question, so thanks very much for coming tonight. I appreciate it. And remember, the next one is going to be here on the 17th of October. That's a Thursday night at 6 o'clock. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate thank you. it. Thank you.